Does your homebrew taste bad? Let's see if we can fix it. A bad taste in your beer, mead, cider, or wine is called an off flavor. There are a ton of different off flavors, and they each bring their own challenges. Some you can get rid of. Others are basically permanent, and you either have to live with them or dump it out. It's important to understand that off flavors can ruin months of work, and learning how to avoid them or how to fix them helps bring some consistency and a higher quality to your brewing. Learning to never get off flavors is seriously leveling up your brewing. Now we all make mistakes and I've had plenty of off flavors in my brews over my 15 years of home brewing. And it's important not to get discouraged by those flavors because they're a learning opportunity. You have discovered something new in your home brewing journey and now you're discovering how to avoid it or fix it so it doesn't ruin something in the future. So today, we are speed running through seven of the most common off flavors. Up first is diacetyl, which causes a buttery and kind of slick mouthfeel. Diacetyl in very, very small amounts can be kind of fun, but generally it is an off flavor. And most commonly you see this off flavor in lagers. The most common reason you're gonna have diacetyl is that your yeast just didn't have time to clean it up. See, diacetyl is a natural byproduct of fermentation, and usually the yeast will go through and clean it up at the end of fermentation before you ever get to packaging. The cleanup of diacetyl usually happens at warmer temperatures, and while lagers ferment usually at a cooler temperature, it is important to bring them up close to room temperature so the yeast can activate their diacetyl cleanup mode and then drop out of suspension. So essentially the cause of this off flavor is incomplete unfinished fermentation. It's fermentation that got almost all the way there but didn't cross the finish line. The best thing you can do to avoid diacetyl is to give your yeast enough time at the right temperature to clean up after themselves before you package the beer. Don't rush the process. Just be patient and let it play out. Number two, acetaldehyde. This one tastes like sour green apple. Think Granny Smith just taking over your beer. It ain't great. Like diacetyl, this is a sign that you packaged your homebrew too early. The yeast was not given enough time to clean up after themselves. Acetaldehyde is a natural byproduct of fermentation, and the yeast just need to clean up after themselves. You can avoid it by making sure that you're pitching the right amount of yeast for your brew. Pitching the right amount of yeast is your preventative measure for getting too much acetaldehyde in your beer or meat or wine. But if you do get some in there, you're detecting that little bit of sour apple, just give it time, let the yeast clean up after themselves. And you might even stir it with a sanitized implement just to make sure you're rousing some of that active yeast back up into the brew so they can get in there and do some of that cleanup. Patience, patience, patience. Number three, oxidation slash oxidization. Because really what has happened is your brew has oxidized. Oxygen is really important at the beginning of fermentation. Yeast need it to do their work. But after fermentation, you want to make sure there is as minimal oxygen exposure as you can muster because that oxygen will get in there and just destroy your flavor compounds. And it can turn a really lovely wine or meat or beer into something that tastes like wet, moldy, old cardboard. Blech. Generally, you're going to get oxidization in your brew from three different mechanisms. It's either too much headspace during aging, so it's absorbing oxygen during aging, or it's poor racking practices. Maybe you're pouring your brews or you're getting a lot of air in the siphon as you're transferring, or bad bottling practices. Maybe you're pouring into bottles or you're getting too much air in your siphon when bottling, or you're waiting too long before you cap or cork those bottles. You really want to minimize how much oxygen exposure your brew gets anytime it is open to the air because oxidization is irreversible. Once that brew is destroyed, it's destroyed forever. Number four, phenols. 
Now, we're not talking about delicious phenolics like clove in uh, Belgian Cezanne. What we're talking about is the gnarly stuff. We're talking medicine and Band-Aid and plastic. And a lot of times these flavors come from bacterial infection. You really want to make sure that you are thoroughly cleaning and sanitizing all of your gear because a bacterial infection can get in there and not just ruin your brew, but can also ruin your gear. If you're using anything plastic, like fermentation vessels, turkey basters, or spoons, all of that can get infected with that bacteria and you'll almost never get it back out. So you're losing gear in the process. You can also get phenols from sanitizer residue if you are using a rinse-off sanitizer and haven't effectively rinsed it off. Or you can get it from chlorine or chloramine in your water reacting with other ingredients and creating that phenolic band-aid-y kind of flavor. Again, you want to minimize the air exposure to your brew as much as possible because the bacteria, the wild yeasts, all that stuff lives in the air around us and it can get in there and ruin your brew. And really, really make sure that you have a stringent sanitizing routine to eliminate any vectors of cross-contamination in your brewing. And this probably goes without saying, but avoid chlorine at all costs, whether it's chlorine as a sanitizer, which is an outdated and honestly terrible practice, or chlorine in your water, which is why I often like to brew with bottled spring water. Number five, sulfur. Sulfur comes from yeast stress, and generally it comes from not giving your yeast enough nitrogen, nutrient like Fermate O, Fermate K, Diammonium Phosphate, because yeast need nitrogen in order to thrive. If you're not giving them enough nutrient, then they're gonna get stressed out and generally start throwing sulfur smells. Now this is salvageable. If it's early in fermentation, you can do what's called splash racking, where you just pour it back and forth a few times from vessel to vessel to mix in some oxygen and off-gas that sulfur. Then you wanna hit it with more nutrients so that sulfur smell doesn't come back. If the sulfur's real bad and you're already through fermentation or you're near the end of fermentation, you can use a sanitized copper wire swirl it around inside the carboy for a few minutes and the copper will bond to the sulfur. Some of that stuff will flake off. You might not be able to see it. It's microscopic. And those bound up compounds will land at the bottom of your carboy and you can safely rack off of them. I have treated brews with copper many times over my 15 years of brewing and it always works. However, sometimes you may need longer copper contact or multiple copper treatments in order to make it work. It's like a magic trick. It's really amazing how fast it can work. The best thing you can do to avoid a sulfur off flavor in your brews is to ensure you're using the right amount of nutrient for your yeast. Generally in beers, this isn't a problem because you get a lot of nutrients from the grains. But in meads, wines, and ciders, you're always going to need some additional nutrient to make sure that it has enough to finish fermentation in a healthy way. Number six, souring. Again, this one comes down to an infection. You got some kind of little buggy in there that created a bunch of acid. And usually it's lactic acid, which is kind of a smooth but tart acid. Now sometimes you can get acetobacter in there which will turn your brew into vinegar. This is pretty uncommon and it's really obvious when it's vinegar. Smell your brew, smell some distilled vinegar, and if they smell pretty similar you can be pretty sure that you got an acetobacter infection. Again, it's pretty rare. But if you got a different kind of bacteria that created say lactic acid, you're not going to really be able to get that back out of there, but you can work around it. Maybe that soured beer now becomes a fruited beer and you just lean into the acid. Or if it was acetobacter and you've now got a one gallon jug of vinegar, congratulations, you've got like a lifetime supply of vinegar. Now it is important to note that some brews will taste acidic after fermentation and that's just their natural state of being. Particularly mead and wine can be very sour at the other end of fermentation and generally that just means you need to balance with a little bit of added sweetness, whether it's honey or sugar, in order to offset that sourness. A lot of folks will think that their mead has been infected, when in reality, it's just very, very tart because honey is a little bit acidic and there's no longer any sugar in that mead to counterbalance the sourness. 
if you have got a souring bug in your brew, it is really important to throw out anything plastic that came in contact with your brew because all the little kind of micro lacerations that are in plastic can be a kind of a harboring ground for those bacteria. Unfortunately, it's going to need to be a total loss for anything plastic. Now, anything that's glass or stainless steel, you're going to want to really, really wash thoroughly and really, really sanitize well in order to make sure you have obliterated any of those souring bacteria. An infection that starts to infect your gear is going to start to infect every single brew that you're brewing, and you don't want that. Finally, number seven, cork taint. You may not have heard of this one. It is not super common, but it does happen. Cork taint comes from TCA, which is a compound created by like molds and fungi inside the cork, and then that compound interacts with chlorine or chloramine in water, forming the cork taint flavor, which is musty and old and moldy and can actually obliterate the flavor of your wine. It can remove the fruity flavor, turning it into something that's kind of like sour and musty and terrible. Generally, if you're gonna interact with cork taint on the homebrew scale, it's going to have come from infected corks that have come in contact with water that has chlorine or chloramine in it from your water processing plant. The easiest way to avoid it is to use synthetic corks or use bottle caps or flip top bottles instead of using cork. But this is not to tell you not to cork your brews. I have been corking for 15 years and I have never run into cork taint in my home brews. These seven issues kind of boil down to three areas that you can work on. Sanitation issues. Sometimes off flavors are gonna come from poor cleaning and sanitizing practices that lead to microbial contamination or contamination from chlorine or chloramine. The solution, thorough cleaning and proper sanitizing, including avoiding bleach or other forms of chlorine. The second cause, fermentation temperature and time. If your brew gets too warm, you might get fusel alcohols or other solvent kind of flavors. If your brew is too cold, you might get an incomplete fermentation leading to acetaldehyde or diacetyl forming in your brew that the yeast never have an opportunity to clean up. You want to make sure that you're treating your yeast how they need to be treated, respecting how much nutrient they need and what temperatures they operate at. And third, packaging errors. Oxygen exposure during bottling or kegging can lead to rapidly stale brews. Additionally, bad seals, whether it's on your airlock or your caps or your corks, or maybe there's a lot of headspace in your fermentation vessel during aging. Any of this can lead to too much oxygen getting mixed up into your brew after fermentation is complete. If you do have too much headspace, it's always a good idea to purge that with wine saver gas or just carbon dioxide gas to make sure that you've got a little bit of a blanket of inert gas on top of your brew, not just a bunch of oxygen. And of course, minimizing the amount of time your brew is open to the open air in the room will also help avoid an oxidative fault. Prevention is key. You want to know what you need to know before you start brewing, and you want to control as many of the extraneous variables as you can to prevent off flavors from creeping in to your homebrew. And of course, keep good notes so you know kind of everything that happened with that brew. So if you do get an off flavor, you can track down the source. Some of these off flavors can improve with just patience or, you know, low intervention methods like stirring in a copper wire. Others like cork taint or oxidization are permanent. And that's the point where you have to just resign to dumping it out. Unfortunately, sometimes the best option is to just dump that brew out and chalk it up to a learning experience. Have you encountered other off flavors before or have you fixed an off flavor not mentioned in this video? Drop a comment down below and let us know. And of course, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You don't wanna miss any upcoming content from Craft or Brew. We have a lot of interesting stuff coming up in the next few months. Until next time, I'm BC here for Craft or Brew and I hope you've got good things brewing.